Those of us who love Munster Rugby are really looking forward to this Thursday evening in Parky Cueve, home of GA in Cork, for the first time ever is going to play host to a Munster Rugby game. And what a game it's going to be against South Africa A, because Munster Rugby has this incredible tradition of games against the touring nations, be it New Zealand, Australia, South Africa. There have been some absolutely epic encounters and tremendous results from Munster. Very famously, 1978, beating New Zealand and Thoman Park by 12 points to nil. In 1992, in Musgrave Park in Cork, the world champions Australia were beaten. And in other great days, such as in 2016, when Munster beat the All Black Maoris. So will we have another great result this Thursday evening? But what we've done today is we've managed to get together some of those players who were involved in the big victories against the touring teams. Jerry Ginger McLaughlin was a prop on the 1978 team that beat the All Blacks famously. Peter, the Claw Clawhessy, was on the team that beat Australia back in 1992. And Ronan O'Manley was part of the team that won in 2016 against the All Black Maoris. Ginger, I was rereading Stand Up and Fight coming down on the train today, and you feature really prominently in it because it wasn't just winning for Munster, it was winning for yourself and getting your shot at the Irish team, wasn't it? Yeah, I'd been around for a long time before that, about 10 years since 68. And I mean, you get one chance and to play against New Zealand, like again, there would have been another, you know, event that you say, right. You know, if we can do something here, like you never know, the selectors might think twice about you. So, look at the end of the day, then everything went our way, and I kind of like an Irish trial, and the rest is history, as the fellow said. But there was a great tradition, wasn't there, for Munster in playing against touring teams before it didn't come out of nowhere, this game in Thoman Park in 1978. It was something that Munster had been building up to, and it come close in the draw only five years earlier in Musgrave Park. They had, yeah. I mean, you can go back into the 50s and 60s. I remember in the 60s, uh, you know, myself, I was born in 51, so in 63 I was 12 years of age. My father took me out to see Munster against Leinster and Torn Park and beaten 6-3. I had a cousin, yeah, she played with your Munsters afterwards, um, Mika Callaghan. So what a sense in the family. <laughs> <laughs> I was my mother's side. <laughs> well, uh, Mika the Great came that day, like, you know, and kind of one of my heroes after that, and Brian O'Brien, who was my coach and mentor and Shannon as well. He had a great game that day, you know, and Tommy Keenan. So all those names and all those kind of events, those kind of things that were happening in the 60s, kind of were, were still with me in the, in the 70s. But the Interpros didn't matter as much in those days, really, did they? It was the days when the touring teams came to either Limerick or Cork, which really got us, us the Munster legend established a bit. It was, uh, Munster always got a chance to play the, the foreign teams, you know, when they came over. I suppose you you get used to that event, then, like, and people get used to kind of um, kind of expect the monster to, to show up on the day, which happens in most of the, uh, of the matches. You know, they always give South Africa, Australia, and, and New Zealand a great match. So inevitably, at some stage, we were going to win, and it just happened that on that day with a magical team, like you know, people like Tony Ward and people like that who could who know how to win matches. Now you would have been about 12 at the time. Were you one of the 100,000 or so who got into Thoma Park that day? I was there, yeah. I was in the, pof, the pocket of the duffel coat that was thrown up into the air. <laughs> Are you genuine about that? Because you know there's so many people who actually claim to have been no, in Thoma no, Park. I, I, you were I, definitely there, were you? No, I wasn't there. No, <laughs> <laughs> um, no I, I can remember it okay, but I wasn't at the match, though. Yeah, what do you remember of it? I, I look, I was only a kid then, so... It was, you know, it was great for, like, my dad would have been big followed rugby, you know, all the family, my grandparents, and it was a great occasion, and for, like to beat the All Blacks was just out of this world, you know, for, as, as, a, as a young fella, I suppose, after the game we were all out, out in the greens with the rugby balls, we were playing rugby for weeks afterwards. Yeah, it was one of these great things for establishing Munster as a team, rather than just all the clubs as well, it was, yeah, and made and up Munster. Yeah, and look, for years afterwards, like, as we were growing up, you know, we did, Somewhere we'd always have a video of the match and we'd always be talking about it and go back and watch it again. Out of the 12 minutes or so that existed the match, well, was, <laughs> it wasn't on television in those days, which in some respects might have actually added to all of the, the legend and myth about it. Yeah, it probably did. Like, well, you didn't see all the mistakes that we actually made. <laughs> <laughs> it was a tough game though, wasn't it? And, the, and I suppose this will come, we'll come to this in a minute about Australia in 92. 
but some of the All Black management gave out about the kamikaze tackling and the approach he took to the game that day. I suppose, you know, Tommy Kiernan like, had played, he was, what, four times a lion. So he had played against all these great sides and he knew, like, unless you get stuck into them and get the tackles in, that you weren't going to go anywhere. The only word I ever remember him saying to us was, tackle, tackle, tackle. And even half time that message came out, tackle, tackle, tackle. So you know what you had to do to win the match, you know. So events went our way as well, you know. I mean, there was a bit of rugby played as well. You know? <laughs> rugby was very different back then, though, wasn't it? Because I suppose you let them have the ball a lot of the time, even in the lineouts in those days before lifting. You let them slap the ball back, and you just swarmed all over them all day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how months of rugby was played as well. You know, put pressure on the opposition. I mean, we weren't the kind of the most finesse of our provinces. And we, we relied on boot, bollock and bite like ha half the time, like, you know, especially when someone came to town, just to remind them what Torman Park is like. And of course, you'd 100,000 people at the match roaring you on, and you, you felt like that there was more than you out there, actually, you know? Well, it was only 12,000, wasn't it? But it sounded like 100,000. Definitely, yeah. But you mentioned Tony Ward, though, because you came from a club, I think, traditionally, you played with nine players. The ball didn't go beyond the scrum half. I'm amused to hear you actually praising Tony Ward for what he could do at 10. Yeah, well, actually, eight and a half. The scrum half might get a ball halfway through the game. Yeah, but Tony, Tony Ward was magic, like, you know? He was, he was a bit of a mystery man in a, in a lot of ways because he could do anything on the field at that stage. You know, he was actually European Player of the Year in 1978 and in 79. And even that little cheeky chip which he did inside his own 22, you know, early on in the match. I mean, if he had done that with Shannon, would nearly have given out like hell to him, like, you know, put the ball away as far as you can. But I mean, everything came off for him, like, you know, so he had confidence in himself and we all trusted him, you know, which is great to have an outside half outside you there who, who can t turn the match around. We wouldn't have been used to that in Shannon, it would have been a simpler game altogether. Famously at halftime, your captain, Donald Caniff, the scrum half, said, immortality beckons. Did you, even at the end of the game, how long did it take for the realisation of what you had done to really sink in? And the fact that we'd still be talking about it at this stage, 45 years on. Well, it was, it's all personal in a way. Like, you know, my job was just to get into the scrum and get into the head, in, into the rocks and stay there and keep plugging away and make sure they don't... We all knew the All Blacks would never try and go around you, they'd try and go through you. So you just stuck to the game plan. We were 9 0 up at half time. And then, of course, Wardy kicked the drop goal. I think he was falling backwards in his backside, and all of a sudden the ball went over the bar. So 12 0 up, like, you know, you kind of believed then, but at 9 0, you didn't think, you know, have we enough done? Because, you know, the All Blacks never give up, like, you know. And to keep them without scoring, I suppose, was a great achievement, especially, I suppose, on the back line, because they threw the kitchen sink at us. But the, the, the way the boys played on the day, like they're defending, was unbelievable. It's always forgotten then. Australia were beaten down in Musgrave Park in 1981, just three years later as well. Mm. Another part of the tradition of Munster developing. Yeah. Australia, they wouldn't have had the same record as, as the All Blacks, though. You know what I mean? You raised your game to play the All Blacks. I mean, you, you knew that, you know, that the record was come over here and they'd beat all the international teams. So you, you, you got them on a Tuesday, like in, in midweek, so maybe they took the foot off the pedal and, you know, building up for the international. They probably underestimated us. And, um, don't play yourself, don't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, didn't, we, we didn't expect to beat them, but we didn't expect to lose either. You know, it's one of those games you go in, you expect, look, we'll give it what we can. And you have to believe in yourself when you go on the field. You, you can't be expecting that the other team are going to kind of hand you the match. So we knew it, 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 that there were so many people there ex wanting and praying for us to win. And rugby was like a religion in Limerick. That was the culture. So it, of course, it was down in Cork where you were on the Munster team that beat Australia in 92. And Australia weren't just a touring team. They were the world champions at the time. That was an incredible achievement as well. Yeah, that's true. As, as Jerry was just saying there, that New Zealand were ahead of Australia when they were playing. But when we beat Australia, they were world champions. So. Um, that was an outstanding uh, achievement for us and like I remember you had to believe that you know there was no point going out in the pitch and hoping, hoping for the best so we had to believe that we could win the match and I think if we knew if we played, played them in rugby we wouldn't beat them 
if you tried to play an open game against Australia, like it, it was all over. So, as Jerry said, it was a lot of uh, boot and bollock, but more boot and bollock that day. Could tell us a bit more, because Bob Dwyer, the Australian coach afterwards, was absolutely furious at the behaviour of some of the Munster players that I think you might have got special mention. No, it was actually Mick Galway that he was sent off that day. <laughs> he was, yeah, Bob Dewar, oh, he went mad after the match complaining about uh, our illegal scrummaging, as he called it. And at the time, I would have been like Jerry, like, like it was, I hadn't played for Ireland. It was a chance for me again to, you know, to, be, to, be, to be spotted and hopefully get in with a chance. And he actually done me a favour, I think, that he, he was going on so much about it. <laughs> that the Irish selectors actually looked at it and said, oh, maybe this fella isn't too bad after all. So what did you do that day? We'd look, for, apart from the scrummaging, like scrummaging back then, it, you get away with a lot more. Just, it wasn't anything dirtier, it was just the angles that you'd be scrummaging at and stuff like that. But uh, like that whole game, we, we, we looked at it there a couple of years back and we reckoned if it was today, there'd be 13 fellas would have been sent off. <laughs> <laughs> For what type of things? Oh, there were scraps all over the place. At one stage, I remember just the time that Gallup got sent off after the fight. What happened was um, the, Paul McCarthy was actually blamed for it. But what happened was I heel flicks their prop as he was running towards the touchline. So he got up and, and threw a slap at Paul McCarthy. He thought it was him. And Mayhem started in and everyone was in. And even Richie Wallace at the time. Do you remember the Australia used to have the little wallaby at the sideline? Uh, the little teddy bear, we'll call him. And Richie Wallace, his contribution to the fight was he went over and kicked that up into the stand. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever watched any of those old games and games like the Australian yeah, game in 92? I'd, I'd watch the clips of them online or on YouTube or whenever they pop up. But, uh, you know, I suppose as a young fella coming out of school and you kind of look at the, the tradition, the legacy the lads made by winning those games. And then when you get your own shot in, it's, you know, you kind of have to protect that, that tradition that... Can you believe what they used to get away with, though? Uh, well, yeah, the, like to be red cards galore for the modern day with the TMOs and all that. But uh, ah, it's, it's class to watch, and you know, it's, it's it's. Would it have been fun to play in? Do you reckon? Not for me, no. Uh, <laughs> if, if I was in the front row, maybe they get away with a lot more. I think you might have kicked the wallaby over. <laughs> and yeah, wing. yeah I'd be running, running out. But uh, yeah, unbelievable to watch and listen, even listen to the stories, you know. Um, and a Gary Owen man and Shannon man and the Cookies man here beside me and just the different stories that come from uh, and you'll be hearing growing up through the ages, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible. Yeah, given those local rivalries amongst the Limerick clubs and then the rivalries against the Cork clubs as well, just how important was it to put on a Munster jersey in what was still the amateur era back then? Yeah, but that's it. Like Munster was different back then. There was maybe three or four matches played a year and every couple of years you, you go on tour. like you. You could be out playing Munster against Leinster and have two or three hundred people at the match. But I suppose it was kind of a stepping stone for the international team. So that was your next step from club if you play with Munster. Like you, because the selectors weren't really going to club matches back then. Although it was the start of the AIL, the early years of the AIL, when it was probably at its best. And even your Munsters had a great time in, in that era. Yeah, it was around sure, it was the following year that you, your Munsters won the AIL final. And... Uh, but it was a stepping stone. Look, it was a great, as a player, it was a great achievement to play for Munster, to play for your province. You know, it was a step above club level, rugby wise, and if you got selected, you were delighted to get selected. What was it feel like to beat the world champions that day in Musgrave Park? That was amazing. Like, well, we, I, I'd say we partied for about two weeks after that match. But uh, it was the whole atmosphere, like the crowd was unbelievable that day. Like, it, I'd say it was something similar to the lads when they beat the All Blacks. Like the crowd made, definitely make a huge difference because like man for man, there's no way we were as good as, as Australia. Do you know, if we played in rugby, just brilliant after the game. I couldn't believe it, you know, inside the dressing room that we were, we, I think we crowned ourselves world champions after that <laughs> because they, they had just won the World Cup at the time. And you managed to do with the Ireland team famously had just missed out on a year before in the World Cup. That late try that ended Ireland's hopes in the World That's Cup. That's right, yeah, yeah. So we probably got them back for that as well. So the gas actually, there was, there was five or six of that Australian team that we beat in Australia or in Musgrave Park that day that I ended up playing with when I joined Queensland for the Super 12s. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was amazing to be playing against these guys. They were profession, professional at the time. And then to end up actually playing with them down in Australia for a season. 
It was fantastic. And you were brought down to bring your unique scrummaging that Bob Dwyer had admired so that much. That was it, yeah, it? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you not feel a little bit jealous, maybe, of lads like Jerry that they had um, plays and books written about them and their exploits and that to date nothing like that has been done about what happened in Cork in 1992? No, look, there's no jealousy, but we were glad that we, when we beat Australia, we, we kind of said, Oh, that might put the 79 team to bed now. We won't have to be listening to them all the time. <laughs> but they, they, they kept it going, in fairness to them. And of course, there was also an occasion back in 2008 when Munster came very close again, what would have been absolutely remarkable. What, what do you remember of that? You must have seen that that day, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, I was in the stadium that day, and I suppose uh, I was only a year out of school, and I went, and I think it was the, the grand opening of Thomond Park. Um, sure, sure. And uh, there was huge events going on. There was helicopters coming in with the ball, and it was obviously, you know, it was the year of the Celtic Tigers. The year of the Celtic Tigers, absolutely. And uh, I remember the noise um, when the Munster, the New Zealand contingent of the Munster team stepped out and did the hacka. And the noise in the stadium, I'd never forget it. Um, you know, it would give you goosebumps. And I just couldn't believe the atmosphere that was created off that alone. And uh, just the energy. And I know they didn't get over the line that day, but... It came so close, though. It came so close. But like it gave people like me, a young lad coming out of school, it gave me hope to say, Jesus, I want to be part of this. Um, and then, luckily enough, eight years later, I, was, so I got a chance to play my own game against uh, the All Blacks, and, or the Maori All Blacks in uh, Town Park. Yeah, and scoring, of course, a try that day as well. Yeah. How did that feel? Ah, incredible. Um, you know, it was, very, it was a very strange time in Munster around then. Um, obviously, only a couple of weeks earlier, Axel had passed away. Um, Rassi had taken over as a coach, and, uh, you know, there was massive sadness amongst and a void within the squad. And, um, you know, Rassi came in as a coach and he didn't really understand uh, what was needed to, to play against Torrance squads. And I remember early in the week, uh, it was kind of with throughout the academy lads and give them a shot at it. And then I think words were said and eventually we were fully stacked going into it. And, um, you know, massive, as you would, we had a, a huge emotional energy going into the thing. That's an interesting point, though, that, you know, if somebody coming in as a coach from outside wouldn't actually perhaps understand the tradition that was involved in Munster playing against a touring team, that it isn't just a friendly match to give lads a run out in. Yeah, it's, it's never yeah, never a friendly match when you're playing against the Munster side. And, uh, you know, that's, I suppose, when Rassi came in, he didn't understand it. And some of the senior players had to go to him early in the week and let him know the tradition that's there and, you know, the legacy that was left um, and the tradition that was left behind that we have to now protect it. And it very quickly it turned into a very competitive game uh, during the week. So. Um, unbelievable was that, as I said, the emotional energy that was in the squad that um, for those couple of months was huge. And a game like that, how did it compare with, say, playing, for example, in Champions Cup game? It was probably one of the best games I've been involved in as a Munster player. Um, remember, we met in the Clarion the night of the game, and it was howling, wind and rain. And I just remember when we all got on the bus, uh, Rassi gave a speech, and I just remember no one was any, in any doubt that we weren't going to win, you know. Um, they were coming into our backyard. It was just huge emotional energy of the squad, as I said, and there was no one who was in any doubt. It was the most confident I've ever been going into a match. That's interesting because does that suggest there are occasions when belief can carry you forward against possibly regarded as better opposition, but actually if you have that belief in each other and in the jersey and a motivation that that will actually carry you to win a game? Absolutely, yeah. It's, it's belief is massive in rugby, and you know you, a team like that. When you're massive underdogs, you know, sometimes it's, it's nice to be an underdog in a game like that. But when you have twenty six thousand fans behind you, you know conditions that probably didn't let the, the All Blacks play uh, the game they wanted to play. And as the lads pointed out, um, you know you do the hard yards, you do the dirty work, and but you didn't do any of the dirty stuff that happened in their games, though, did you? Uh, oh, no, you wouldn't get away with a Sherby. <laughs> Too many cameras. <laughs> Too many cameras nowadays, yeah. Do you think, though, you were in the early days of the Champions Cup, the Heineken Cup, as it was then. Do you think that Munster's success in the early years and that owed a lot to the tradition that had been built up during those games that you played in, Dak and Cork, that you played in in Limerick in 78, that Munster had the advantage of that tradition to get well, them going? Was, I suppose, look, we've got tradition, but I think a lot of it was to have respect in, you know, in the Munster jersey. Like fellas that would have came before you, they were great players, and it wasn't just a matter of going out playing for Munster. There was a tradition there, and players definitely respected it, and 
they fought like they fought harder. They would give give that extra mile, when, you know, on special occasions like tour inside or in the European Cup as well. Like the first few years in in the European the Heineken Cup, like we we weren't a brilliant team, but we we all fought for each other very hard, and that's what got us places. Yeah, do you think, Jerry, that in retrospect, the winning against New Zealand in '78, against Australia in '92, in particular, are the equal of winning the Heineken Cup in 2006 and 2008? And I think the lads in 2006 and 2008 had a full campaign to go through in, in order to win it. And no game would have been easy. I mean, we, ours is a one-off game. And in a one-off game, you can raise your le the level. And you can target like whatever you've got to do in the day. And then you go back to your club game. But the way the lads would have to go through playing in places like Twickenham and Cardiff and, you know, difficult areas. Like, you know, they, we would have a different trouble winning before at international level even but the lads, what the lads actually did was unbelievable and they were out of the comfort zone as well not playing at Thurman Park I mean you know how long did it take them to be beaten in Thurman Park so they, they were an amazing bunch of people and they, they had been around for a long time so I suppose it was only justice in the end I think that you know they got the, the rewards which, which they got when you come from a generation and probably can't remember too many big games taking place in Cork, like the one that's going to take place this Thursday, Parky Cueve, 42,000 people for an evening time match, which is absolutely terrific. Will people in Limerick be afraid there might be a lot more games going to Cork on the back of that? Yeah, no, look, um, as mentioned already, there's been games in the past in Town Park, uh, all backs in Australia, Town was a great park during the time. And, Look, to, it's probably a record crowd for a club game, um, having that amount of people for a tour inside. Um, and everything that goes behind it again, Rassi, who a former coach of Munster, now going to be on the sideline for South Africa in uh, Parky Cueve. It's going to be incredible. Um, you know, really just uh, one to really look forward to. And again, the traditions that have gone by, all those previous touring squads, and you now it's this generation's turn to, you know, to make their own stamp in the game. But it really shows how oh, the Munster rugby public love the idea of a touring team, don't they? That you would have this match getting this many people going to it. Mm. There's like, I suppose, there's, there's another scalp if they can take it, you know, for a touring side, which for tradition, Munster, they love to be the touring side and um, bring it down to Parky Cueve. Look, it is fantastic, 40,000 odd people, and it would be a special occasion. And I'm sure, look, Probably maybe a lot of our first choice players are going to be away with the national team, but the guys, the younger guys that are going to come in, they, they'll have points to prove now, and this will be their, their big stage. So it might be the biggest game they'll ever play in, some, some guys. Yeah, that was the same for you against the Maoris, and I think for the Munster team in 2008, there were players missing because they were away with the national team. But that gives a fantastic opportunity, doesn't it, for a lot of younger players, if not academy players, but still players who were on the verge of establishing themselves and giving themselves experience in a big game. Uh, massive, absolutely massive, yeah. Uh, Ireland were playing Canada, I think, during when we played the Maori All Blacks, so we were again missing a big cohort of players. And uh, I think there was one or two lads in that squad that were making their debuts that day. And like, what an occasion to make your debut for Munster Rugby um, in front of 26,000 people at home in Thoman Park and playing against the Maori All Blacks, it doesn't get much bigger than that. Was that the highlight of your career? One of them, yeah, definitely. What about you, Clark? Because you've had many highlights over the years. <laughs> a lot of lowlights too. <laughs> <laughs> Glad you're the one who said it. <laughs> yeah, look, obviously I, I, I lost two European Cup finals, which was very disappointing. And I, look, I don't have a lot to show for, for all the years we put in with Munster in Ireland, but one of the highlights of my career was, was winning the AIL in 93 with my club. And what about for you, because I'm lucky enough to have been in Twickenham in 82, the day you dragged the whole Irish pack behind you, dragged them over the line to get a try in the Triple Crown win. Did you have to, did you have to bring that up, man? <laughs> <laughs> well, you told me to beforehand. <laughs> I much prefer playing Gary Orn in Tumon Park in the Cup final, you know. They were the highlights of my early career, you know, because at that stage, obviously, you know, Munster Rugby was based on winning the Senior Cup, and Gary Orn had been the kingpins in Munster for years. So I suppose I learned my whole kind of um, my whole my, my whole experience of how to handle big matches, playing in those in those matches, 
and we won five or six cups. So, you know, that was the start of it. And then, lucky to get on the monster scene with the guys, as I said, who knew how to win matches at that level. And of course, the day in Twickenham was was down to a lot of good luck as well. Like you know, Trevor England kept me on the field. I think I'd have been up in touch on on, on your part of him. Well, just to finish up, a couple of things just to finish up with you. And uh, Ginger, I suppose, I want to ask you first of all, you know, when it comes to what you remember from your career and the friendships you made, I mean, do you still see a lot of the players? Unfortunately, some of the players from that team have passed on, but how important is it to you for that group that you still have each other from 78? Honestly, we wouldn't meet that often, I think. What, every 10 years, we, we, might, we, might, we might get together. But just meeting all the lads in town, like meeting Clare now today and Ronan and people like that, like, you know, because, you know, we're very parochial in Limerick and we stick to our own group, a group of friends and that, you know. But now, like, Limerick is a small little city, you know, and we can all meet and have a pint and we can all meet and have a cup of coffee or whatever. And, you know, the friendship is there. There's great respect, I think, for, all, for everyone in, in the city who, who plays rugby, whether they're a junior player, a senior player, or an international player. There's that camaraderie in, 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 about about company and you know the the clubs you played with and whether you won anything it didn't make doesn't make a blind bit of difference really at the end of the day the fact that you put the jersey on it was very important and what about for you clark because you straddled the amateur era the professional era but how much still is important to you for the friendships and things that you would have made from playing in that red jersey oh, look, it's fantastic look, we don't meet that often as, as we probably should like we meet at matches and funerals and, and weddings but um we, anytime we do meet, you know, we always have a good laugh and talk about the old days and telling stories. And we have an old WhatsApp group going for we see all the, the, the retired lads. So there's a lot of banter going on that every 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 week. Of the two of you, who was the better prop? I wouldn't touch it. He, he was boots. a better tight end. I was a better loose end. Because <laughs> <laughs> you both played on both sides for the scrum on occasions, didn't you? Yeah, I tried to play both sides. <laughs> it just shows what the selectors knew about both sides. <laughs> And as for you, I mean, you're more recently retired, but will the memories of playing for Munster give you, you reckon, a lot for the rest of your life? They will, of course. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy to play for Munster, and it still isn't easy, and it, and it shouldn't be. Um, so to be able to have done it is, you know, it's a huge privilege for me, my family, um, and to, as the last talked about, to be able to get an opportunity to be able to protect the jersey and wear it and play against these touring sides, it's, it's incredible. Yeah, so. Obviously, coming out of the game, it's a little bit different, and a lot of my friends are still in it. And you know, as each of them starts slowly retiring or coming out of the game, they start coming closer to you again. And uh, yeah, it's it's it's, it's been a great uh, journey on the pitch so far, and uh, and enjoying the laugh. And so that's it. Thank you very much for taking the time. We're really looking forward to the match on Thursday evening, which of course is sponsored by Penergy. And we're really hopeful that we will have many more memories to talk about in years to come, just like the memories we've had the opportunity to discuss now. Enjoy the game. <laughs>